Good morning. What a beautiful day out there. It's wonderful to be in the house of the Lord today. We're going to begin in Matthew, the 7th chapter, and the 15th verse. And the Word of God says, Beware of false prophets, which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You shall know them by their fruit. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit. But a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit. Neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore by their fruit ye shall know them. Not every one that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name I've cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. I remember years ago I had two beautiful little trees in my backyard. And we had bought that property and I didn't know what they were. And I watered them and I pruned them and I did everything. And then spring came and they had a blossoms and they were full of blossoms and they, they were beautiful. And then fruit started to come on them, and it was red. And they were like, I have two apple trees. And I mean, they were the most beautiful little apples, and they grew, and they grew, and then they got ugly. And then I found out I had two crab apple trees in my yard. Well, I also had a fireplace, so I hewn them down, and I cast them into the fire. Because I spent a lot of effort for crab apples. You know, crab apple jam is the only thing I've ever heard of, and it was a lot of work, and I didn't really want that. I wanted to reach out in my tree and pull out an apple and just bite into a delicious apple. I didn't have that option. I had them old nasty, and the ones that weren't ugly were wormy. You know, it was just one of those things. It was just... So in my rage and my anger, I hewn them down and I cast them in the fire. But we have to remember, just because things look good, we must put it before the Word of God. Is this what God is calling us? Is this what really what God is saying? You know, when we look at things and if we view them by the way the world views things, you know, oh, that building over there, that church over there is so big and beautiful, it must be the right one. Well, that doesn't mean a whole lot. People... You know, we deal with that all the time. Some of the prettiest people have the ugliest hearts. You know, we've always said, the old saying, you can't judge a book by its cover because we don't know what's inside. You know, most Bibles for years had a black cover. It didn't say nothing. And some of the worst books had the most beautiful covers. I've got some old antique books with beautiful red leather with gold scrolling in it. And some of it's just junk. But they're beautiful books. <laughs> yeah, we got a lot of those. So, Lord, help us to realize the Word of God says to beware of false prophets, which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. They have an intent, and their intent is not that you'll be better or that you'll follow God and that you'll live. They have an intent of, or, or an agenda. Too many people have an agenda. They want to deceive. They want to lie. They want to cheat. I have come into contact with the biggest group of liars that I have ever seen before in my life this last two weeks, without a doubt. The biggest group of liars that I have ever come across. And all I had to do was type into my tablet that I was interested in solar panels on my roof. And I have been bombarded with so many good friends of mine. That's what they say. Oh, my friend, there are so many deceivers out there. If you'll just listen to me. I'll help you through this. Yeah. And all of them are trying to take my money and deceive me. Unreal. How many people have all of a sudden become my bestest buddy? You know, Lord help us. Too many people have a hidden agenda. What are they wanting? You know, when you, when you got to go and look, okay, where's the bottom line? So I decided, okay, I'm going to fix this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell them I have no money. I'm going to do it all on my own. I'm not paying for a contractor. I DIY solar systems. No, I lost a whole lot of my friends. They, they quit emailing me back. They quit talking to me all of a sudden. You're right. They want, well, they want 25-year financing on my house. That's what they want. Lord, help us. You know, we, we get into our mind what we want or what we're doing or where we're going. And people that, oh, I want to help you. 
But their agenda is not helping us. Their agenda is helping themselves. And that's what false prophets do. They're looking for a place to build themselves up, to benefit themselves and not others. And they don't care about what they have to do, lie, cheat, cheat steal, whatever. You know, it, it's sad that right here in Alamogordo, it does not matter what sin that is prevalent in your life, you can find a church that will agree with it. I want three wives. So I, there's a church here that will agree with that. <laughs> don't think so. <laughs> I learned from the Word of God, men can't handle one wife. The last thing they need is a whole bunch. Great Grandpa told us years ago, he says, it's going to take your whole life to learn to read your wife like a book, and then you're going to be too old to start a library. You know, Lord help us. I thank the Lord I have the one I have. And Lord, lead and guide me to, to, to try to understand. Because just as soon as you get a handle on a, your spouse, they change. <laughs> so, but then again, we change. You know, my wife was absolutely positive. Green was my favorite color for many, many years of our marriage. That's beside the point. Green has never, ever been my favorite color. But if you look in my closet a few years back, just about everything I had was green because I was a wise man, a very intelligent man. I realized that my wife liked me in green, so I wore green, and green became my favorite color, even though I never really liked it, but it became my favorite color. I had a hidden agenda. I wanted my wife to be pleased with me. Now, I hope that doesn't make me a false prophet <laughs> or deceiving her, but I don't think I ever told her that I liked green. She just bought me a lot of green, and I wore it. Because that's what made her happy. And later in life, she asked me, "Was that your, that's your favorite color? I said, sweetheart, I hate to break the news to you. It never has been my favorite color. <laughs> and she was really surprised. Huh? <laughs> I, I have a tendency to wear bright colors. I like bright colors. Huh? I've changed. See? I've changed. We all do. I like color. And God is leading and guiding us to what? To truth. Who are you in God? Who did he create you to be? If I have a hidden agenda and I want you to be like me, and I'm leading and guiding you to be more like me, then am I leading and guiding you to the truth that God has for you? Do I have a hidden agenda? We've got to be very careful that how many people want us to be like them so that they can sell you something. Oh, dress like me, buy my suits, do this, do your hair like me. It's like that, there's an there's a insurance commercial and, you know, all these guys are in the barbershop and they're all getting this really goofy, shaved on the head, curly on top haircut because that's going to get them some kind of extra discount on their insurance. And the insurance says it, it never was about that. And then he had to look at his friends and say, oh, I'm sorry, he didn't grow out. Because too often we have this hidden agenda. You've got to be like me. You've got to look like me. You've got to talk like me. You've got to act like me so that you can follow me. And follow me where? The Word of God says the blind follow the blind. And they both end up in the ditch. Because why are we, if we're not leading to the truth, then what are we doing? Why, why was there prophets of Baal? Because Jezebel wanted them. She enjoyed that sinful life. And she wanted other people around her that would benefit her in her sin. Oh, come tell me how wonderful I am. Come tell me how great I am. John the Baptist lost his head because he wouldn't say, it's okay for you to have your brother's wife. Oh, how dare you? How dare you tell the truth? And he lost his head. Lord, help us. It's not always popular to tell the truth. Most people don't want to hear it. Most people don't want to hear it. And that's where a prophet is there. Maybe he's asleep. Call on your, yell a little louder. Can you imagine the foolishness of them jumping on their altar, cutting themselves, bleeding themselves out, screaming and hollering, making a fuss? And they did it all day until the evening and nothing. But when you look at the world and what they do to try and justify the ignorance of their sin. They, don't, they look just as foolish. Lord, help us. Lord, help us that we look at ourselves in light of the Word of God and not the opinion of other people. And we look at ourselves plainly and coldly alone before God. Who am I? Where am I? Because too often it's like in Titus, the first chapter in the 16th verse, the Word of God says, They profess that they know God, but in works they deny Him, being abominable and disobedient and unto every good work. When we deceive ourselves, it's a slippery slope. Next thing you know, we'll accept just about anything. And you see that in people. 
I see that in people that I have known in the past, people that served the Lord in the past, and now they've, they've gone off and done things, and it's like, you've done what? You're doing what? Lord, help us. I had a man one time tell me, and I like to fell completely out of my chair. Okay, y'all, get ready for this. He told me that it was impossible, impossible for women to be holy because it was deeply embedded in them by God to be ungodly and that it takes a righteous man to beat his wife into submission so that she could be holy. Now, my wife is nodding her head because we were sitting together at the table with other ministers when this man said this and and that when his when he was young married man he would have to take a belt to beat his wife into holiness and I thought what in the world what in the world's going on here where did you get this doctrine where did you get this understanding I mean you 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 had some kind of agenda you wanted to control this you, you already had problems and you want to make the Word of God fit your lifestyle, your ungodliness. And too often we do that. We can twist and turn and manipulate the Word to fit ourselves. But it doesn't make it right. It doesn't make it true. It doesn't change who God created you to be. God's desires all would be saved and none would be lost. God did not create you to be, you know, ungodly. If, if, if we know better than that, didn't you think God knows better than that? How many parents look in the crib of a baby and say, oh... You're so cute. I just hope you'll be a mass murderer one day. I mean, that's just not what's going to happen. God did not create you so that you could be in rebellion to him. But you choose to. That's why the prophet says, how long are you going to be between two decisions? You're going to choose one or choose the other. But this playing both sides just doesn't work. When you do not choose to serve God, or you go ahead, choose the world. Go ahead, go do it. But don't pretend to be religious and live in the world. He says, choose this day who you will serve. Choose this day. Otherwise, you're running around as a wolf in sheep's clothing. Lord, help us. You go to church and you get all religious and you change your clothes and you look good and you change your language and you do everything, but you go back to work the next day and you lie, cheat, steal all week long. Are you not a wolf in sheep's clothing? What are you teaching your family? What are you teaching your children? That you have a hidden agenda. You want to go to church and pretend. And, and, and the churches are full. They're completely full. Of people that are wolves in sheep's clothing. And I'm thankful that they are. Because, you know, really, the people that have chosen to be ungodly, Sunday morning, they at least have an option that there's less hypocrites out there to judge them because the churches are so full of hypocrites. Because they're in church pretending to be righteous. So they at least have Sunday morning to go around and not be judged near as bad as they normally would be. And I know people look at me, oh, you can't, that's just ridiculous. I said, yes, it is. I had a man one tell me, he said, I ain't going to your church. I said, well, why not? Too many hypocrites. I said, there's plenty of room for more. Man, I got lots of seats open. There more hypocrites can come. Where else would you want to be? Churches for sick people. Churches for lost people. Churches for those that are desiring to be found. Churches for people that need to be loved. How many people have you come into contact this week that are lost, lonely, and in need of love? We'll invite them to church next week. It's not for the perfect, it's not for the righteous, it's not for the holy, it's not for the, especially for the self-righteous, because they already figured it out. Lord, help us. And when we have a hidden agenda, we're wolves, and we don't even know it sometimes. In 2 Corinthians, the 11th chapter, and the 13th verse, For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into the angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing for his ministers also be transformed as ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. There are people in this world that are running around looking right, but not doing right. Not living by the word, not preaching the word, but looking right. Gathering people up. I remember years ago, a... They had a guy in El Paso. He was double ties for double blessings. And he had a giant church. And they, they thought that was the greatest thing. They didn't want a hundredfold. They wanted two hundredfold. And then people ate that up. Find that in the Bible. Find that in the Word of God anywhere. The church of the ATM. I guess that's what it was. I don't know what it was called. Because that's all they were looking for. And there was a young man I, I was visiting with. And he was going there. And he says, man, I've been giving this double ties. And I'm not getting blessed. I said, are you living right? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I said, okay. Let me, let, let's talk about this. I said, in the last year, has you, you and your wife had a fight? Oh, no, we're doing great. I said, but God's not blessing you? Oh, no. 
I said, I remember when you y'all threw the ceiling fan through the sliding glass door when one of your fights. Well, yeah, we used to have a hard time. I said, but you ain't had an argument or a fight in a year. Yeah, but God's not blessing you. Oh, no, I'm having a hard time making my bills. I said, but you haven't had this or you hadn't had that. And, and we went through a whole list of all these other things. But all he could see was the money. Oh, I'm still, I'm still struggling for my bills. I said, maybe because you're paying too much. God didn't ask for 20%. God asked for obedience. Choose me. And I'll show you a way of life. I'll show you who you could be. I'll show you who you should be. And in reality, God wants it all. And he gives you back 90%. And with what he gives you back, you'll do 10 times more than you did if you would kept the 10. Because it's, a, it's not about dollars. That's what bothers me so much. People think you need money. God doesn't need money. He fed 5,000 with a little boy's lunch. But you think he needs your money. He needs your obedience. When you talk about, the, 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 uh, when they're at, at Mount Carmel, they'd been in drought. The economy was devastated. The people were devastated. There were no money. The most valuable thing that they had, he's pouring on the altar. They had no rain in three years. He's pouring the water there. Not a little bit of water, but buckets and barrels of water. In the middle of a drought, he's pouring out the most valuable thing that they had was water. And he's giving it all to God. And that's why he says, today, choose. Choose. Who are you going to serve? Are you going to play games with God? Or are you going to serve God? Who are you going to serve? If your God be God, let him answer with fire. But if mine is, serve him. And he took the most valued commodity because it's not about money. It's not about possessions. It's not about things. It's about obedience. You want to be blessed? Be obedient. You want your life to be turned upside down? Be obedient. In Luke, the 22nd chapter, and the 31st verse, And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desire to have you. Now, if that doesn't put a chill in your back, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath a desire to have you. Satan wants you. Now, if anybody knew what was going on, Christ is talking to him. He says, Satan wants you. Wait a minute. But, but, but Lord, I, I'm sure you're going to cover me, right? You're going to stop him? Just think about what was going through his mind. That he may sift you as wheat. That's a very distinctive wording. Because that's something that they all understood. To be sifted as wheat. That's when you went to the harvest. And you put your wheat in your basket. And you went up on top of the hill. And when the breeze came by, you tossed your grain up in the air. And the chaff would blow off. And the wheat would fall back down in your basket. That's how you cleaned your wheat. Now think about that. Satan wants you that he might sift you as wheat. He, might, he wants to toss you through the air. He wants to turn your life completely and totally upside down. And this is what the Lord is telling him. But I have prayed for thee. And that's where he got, Woo-hoo, okay, it's not going to happen because I got the prayers of the Lord right here. No, I don't think so. <laughs> but I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. I'm sure he thought, wait a minute, that, I don't, I, I'm not liking where this is going. Put yourself in Simon's shoes. Satan wants me. He wants to really turn my life upside down. And the Lord's praying that I won't lose my faith. I don't like where this is going. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brother. That's when you say, Lord, I really appreciate that comment, but this is the new plan. You're going to stop him. He's not going to touch me. And I'm not going to have a hard time. That's what's going to happen here, Lord. But no. He says, I have a desire. Satan has a desire to sift you as wheat. How many times have we felt like we've been sifted as wheat? Jobs and family and things and possessions and money. Just just nothing mattered. Just we're upside down. We're this way, we're that. We don't know which way is up. The, everything is just wrong. That's exactly where Simon was. Satan had desire to toss him and throw his life up into the air. And that's where he was. And God says, I prayed for you that your faith not fail. Not that you wouldn't go through it, but that your faith wouldn't fail. That you'd stay with the Lord and you'd stay strong. And when you come through it, strengthen the brethren. You are going to be a pillar of strength like you cannot imagine. Because he's going to toss you and things are going to be upside down. And all the garbage in your life will be blown away. All the things that don't matter will be gone. And what really matters is still going to be in the basket. And with that is your faith. And you're going to strengthen the brethren. And say, wow, what an ordeal. But God is with me. I knew a minister one time. He, he had a hard time praying for the sick because in his entire life he'd never been sick. He had a hard time praying for the poor 
Because in his entire life, he had never missed a meal. I'm not saying that's a bad thing. That's a good thing, actually. That says a lot for his family. It says a lot for him. He lived a wonderful life. But here he is in the ministry and don't know what it's like to be sick. Don't know what it's like to have a financial issue. Don't know what it's like to be, have troubles. Lord, help us. I don't have to be an alcoholic to pray for an alcoholic. But sometimes alcoholics won't go to anybody that hasn't been an alcoholic. Drug addicts won't go to anybody that hasn't been a drug addict. They feel like they have some extra knowledge. I don't have to be a drug addict to pray for you. But sometimes being through it helps you to strengthen the brethren. Having been through loss, you know, I've been able to visit with people lately. I've cried with a lot of people lately. Because now I can tell them, you know what? Losing your father is not an easy thing. And it's not going to go away in a day or two. It's something you work through with God. Now, I could have said those words a few years ago and been just as comforting then, but now we cry together. Lord, help us. Who you are is what you've been through. And God takes your experiences and allows you to not be a wolf in sheep's clothing. You have become a sheep that is battered and scarred and been through the law of life. And once you've fallen off that cliff once or twice... You can tell others, it's a good idea if you don't get close to that edge. And, oh, I'll do what I want. You will. And I did. See this scar? See that scar? See this broken leg? That, that cut? You know, for years I taught knife safety. I told them it is possible to close that knife up on your finger and it'll cut you. But now I can show them a crooked finger. It's going to have a little bit more, you know, reality to it. I remember years ago there was a young man... And he worked at a, at a camp for kids up Wyoming or Montana or somewhere. And he used to talk to them about bear safety and cleaning out your tent and not having smellables and this and that and the other. And uh, every year he'd start off the week with that talk. And they'd get a few bags of this and that and the other. And then towards the end of his talk, he says, now I know you aren't listening to me. And he said, oh, okay. And then he'd pull his shirt up and there's this big gash which was the paw of a grizzly when he was young he says and i had this and this in my tent and i hit it and this is what happened when the bear came through my tent he says and then right out of their pockets they filled trash cans of things that were smellables immediately they cleared out their stuff because why what was the difference he the same person said it but now there was the example of the reality of life and all of a sudden they listened simon says hey satan He's going to want to sift you like wheat. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no. I've been there. I'm not talking to you. I don't have a hidden agenda. I'm not playing games with you. I want to know because I've been there. I've been upside down. I've had my entire world taken out from underneath me. And now I'm back to help you not do the same. Or to help you find strength in the midst of trouble. Verse 33. And he said unto him, Lord, I am ready to go with thee both into prison and to death. He said it, but he didn't know what he was saying. Jesus was trying to tell him, it's going to happen. This is, this, is, this is what we're dealing with. This is going to happen. And he said, I'm ready for it. Woo-hoo, yeah, let's go. Let's go. Go to prison, death, hot. Let's go. No. Why? Because, because before he'd been through it, he didn't really understand what it was like to go through it. I'm sure he was... Come on, guys, let, let's go kill somebody. Let's go do this. We're going to fight to the death. How could he say that? Because he had never been in a fight to the death. The fight to the death he'd been used to is beating the fish with, over the head with a club. That's a different fight to the death than what they're talking about. He had a misunderstanding. And too many times, people are rolling around with a misunderstanding. Let's go do this. Let's go do that. Let's... And they're not following the truth. They have a hidden agenda. They're wolves in sheep's clothing. We're going to go do God's work. Okay. We're going to go fix it. With what? With lies, deceit, anger, murder. How are you going to do God's will that way? And he said unto him, Lord, I am ready to go with thee both into prison and to death. And he said, I tell thee, Peter, the cock shall not crow this day before that thou shalt thrice deny that thou knowest me. And he said unto him, when I set you without purse and script and shoes, lacked ye anything? And they said nothing. Then said he unto them, But now he that hath a purse, let him take it. And likewise his script. And he that hath no sword, 
let him sell his garment and buy one. For I say unto you, that this, that this that is written must yet be accomplished in me. And he was reckoned among the transgressors for the things concerning me having an end. And they said, Lord, behold, there are two swords. And he said unto them, is it enough? They're ready to go to war. But they didn't understand what the battle was. And too often we're ready. I'm ready to go. Oh, we're going to. But we don't know what the real battle is. We're not fighting flesh and blood. We fight a spiritual battle daily. And you can't fight a spiritual battle with a sword. You have to fight it with truth. And in the midst of finding your truth, you're going to come across people that look right, sound right, but the spirit's not right. And they're going to lead you off the edge of a cliff if you let them. Because it's not the word of God. It's not the truth of God. It's what we want to hear. Lord, help us. I don't know how many times I've sit in services and people invite me to come to church and it's like, oh, that's wonderful. I'd be glad to come. And there's no spirit. They sing the songs. You know, there's certain songs that just make your heart bubble. You know that? There's certain songs. And it's like, or they, or, they, or they give you a feeling like way back in the day. And they lift your soul. And it's just, and then you, you hear that song and it's like, wow. I, could, I didn't know you could mess up that song. You know, I've heard How Great Thou Art sung pretty bad. I mean, pretty, pretty, pretty bad. But it still makes me feel good inside. But you can hear How Great Thou Art sung extremely well and have no spirit. Just flat. But the music was perfect. The vocals were absolutely incredible. They knew exactly when to... The whole thing? I mean, just absolutely perfection. But the spirit is just not there. Lord, help us. And you can hear it on an untuned guitar with a twang and a broken string. And just rejoice because the spirit is right. God has called us to see the truth in what we're looking at. Not the visual see, but with spiritual eyes. Choose. Choose to choose. If God be God, choose. Serve him. We're fruit inspectors. So Grandma Jelly always told us we're fruit inspectors. Take a good look at those around you and by their fruit, you'll know who they are. Not by what they say, not by how they look, not by how they dress, but by their fruit. Because a crab apple tree in the off season is a beautiful thing. I remember one time we stopped on the side of the road. I forget who we were with. Might have been Grandpa Jackie. I don't know. It was a beautiful tree. And we were at a roadside park. And he said, oh, wow. And ran out and grabbed some fruit off that tree. And it looked beautiful. And he bit into that. And he just about lost it. Persimmons. You know, when they're ripe, they're good. When they're not, you can't get the pucker off of you. <laughs> Oh, man. And I tell you what. Ooh. But the tree's beautiful. But the fruit, wow. And too often, that's exactly what people are running around. I'm a man of God, woman of God. But when you make time around them, you start to get that same pucker feeling if you ate a ripe, an unripe persimmon. And you think, is it me? No, it's not you. When you honestly go before God and say, Lord, I give all. I choose to choose you. I choose to follow you. Lead and guide me to truth. Let me see the truth. You don't have to have a bolt of lightning come down and find the fire and suck up all the water and the altar. And the, you don't have to have that. When you turn your life over to God and you give him all, you can have it feel. That same feeling comes on when it's overwhelming. And it's like, whoop, I don't belong here. I have sit in services and people just screaming and hollering and jumping around and everything just, wow. And my spirit is less like, whoop. And I thank God, I must not be saved. I must be wrong. So then I go through the checklist. Dear Lord, please forgive me. What have I done? Where have I failed you? Where have I? You know, I'm just praying to myself, just trying to cover my bases. You know, I don't want to be sitting there in church and them all having a wild good time and me not feeling nothing and the rapture happened and they go and I sit there, I can cover my bases. Am I right? Am I, who did I upset? Who did I have, have I cheated? Have I, you know, I'm just trying to cover myself. And I pray to God. I say, what, what's wrong? He says, I don't know. I don't, I don't feel it either. <laughs> because sometimes it's all about show and not about content. Those prophets of Baal had a good show going on. I guarantee there was a lot of people watching because they were flipping and a flopping and a jumping and a cutting themselves and screaming and a hollering and laying on the altar. And the, I mean, the whole thing. It was better than any carnival that came to town. But nothing, nothing. 
Because they were crying out for God to do something powerful. And their God had no power. Lord, help us to cry out for power in our lives. I don't want to go somewhere and find the power of God. I want to carry the power of God with me. I talked about this last week. When you walk into this building, the power of God is in this building. Only because it came in with you. When you walk out of this building, this is a building. Some people have this strange understanding that God's sitting here waiting. And his spirit sits here waiting until we come back. Foolishness. Because that means if, I, if God's waiting here for me to come visit him, then when I'm out there, I'm all alone. I got no backup. Wow, that would be scary, wouldn't it? Wouldn't that be just terrifying? Lord, help us. But when we walk out, the Spirit of God comes with us. Everywhere I go, the Spirit goes before me. And when the Spirit says, whoop, stop, maybe I've gone the wrong way. Maybe I've gone as far as he wants me to go. Maybe I'm making a mistake. Lord, help us to listen and realize God cares. He didn't create you to be a false prophet. He didn't create you to be a deceiver. He did not create you to be a liar. He created you to be glorious and holy in his sight. A leader for your family. A leader in your workplace. A leader in your friends. A leader of your neighborhood. That when people have a hardship, when they have difficulties, when they have trials, I don't know what to do. I'm going to go see Walter. Because he has a calm spirit. He'll help me understand. A voice of reason. Oh, I don't know what's happening. I'm just getting overwhelmed. Mary Lou will tell. She gets the finger out. You get over there. We're going to go pray. What? Right now. I know she's done it. I'm not telling that. I'm not, I'm not speaking out of school here. But you know what? Sometimes that's what it has to be. The child of God is not here for yourself. The child of God is for the benefit of those around you. God has led you and guided you that you might strengthen the brethren. That you might strengthen those that are around you. That you might be a pillar of light. That you'll stand up and represent Christ. And the world that doesn't have Christ will come and say, I don't know what you got, but I want some of it. And you might have to stick your finger in their face and say, get over there. And we'll pray. Or you might have to text them, grow up. Stop acting like this. You know better. You were raised better than this. Because people are going to have to wake up and say, today I'm going to choose to serve. I'm going to choose not to follow my own stupidity any longer. I'm choosing to follow God. I'm choosing truth. Luke 11 and 34. The light of the body is the eye. Therefore, when thy eye is single, thy whole body also is full of light. But when thine eye is evil, thy body is full of darkness. Take heed, therefore, that the light which is in thee be not darkness. If thy whole body, therefore, be full of light, having no part dark, the whole shall be full of light, as when the bright shining of a candle doth give thee light. When I don't know where to go, when I don't know what to do, I've got to fill my light with Christ. I've got to fill my life. I've got to go back and check my bases. I have to prove myself. That's what the Word says. Study to show thyself a proof. A proof of what? To God. Where am I? How do I know? You know, when we get in the midst of a battle out there, the Satan, Satan comes in and he wants to destroy you and, and you think, I'm, I'm failing you, God. Simon, Simon, he desires to sift you as wheat. He wants your world upside down. He wants you to think you failed him. Why? Because he's attacking your core. He's attacking your foundation. He can disrupt your life. And you're no longer a threat to him. The Word of God says, that's not what I've called you to. That's not it. He can't disrupt you. Oh yeah, the world can toss you. Things can go bad. You're going to have problems. <laughs> but when you're through it, the faith that you had before it will give you stability afterwards. Calm, stability, and reality. Lord, help us. But too often we get in the midst of adversities and we this can't happen. God, I, how, how could you do this to me? He didn't do it to you. We live in a world full of sin and disease and sickness. We live in a world full of tragedy. But on the other end, God is carrying us through. Why? Because I choose to serve. Because we stood and we choose righteousness. I choose holiness. I choose salvation. God called us and I chose. And I choose not to play games with God anymore. I choose not to follow people that have a hidden agenda. Because Christ didn't have a hidden agenda. 
His desire is that all would be saved and none would be lost. Remember, that's his agenda. That's it. That's his whole plan. After he was crucified, he went into hell and he led captivity captive. That's what the word says. Now, okay. Think about the people that were already in hell. And Jesus comes down there with the keys of the kingdom and says, you got a chance. Let's go. He emptied the place out. Who do you think is down there in hell said, you know, I'm not quite done with my massage. I'm going to stay a while. Really? No. They was running and getting. <coughs> he left captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. He cleared the place out. Lord, help us. Allow him to clear your place out. Allow him to come into your heart and say, you've been lied to. There are some things that we have in our, in our mental psyche and the way we live and the way we do that people have taught us that weren't biblical. And we rely upon those things. Oh, grandma taught me. You know what? If it aligns with the word of God, hold on to it. If it don't, walk away. The traditions of men will lead you to hell. Lord, help us. Seek the truth. And serve God. Seek the truth. And serve God. And when hardship comes, remember, God is with you. And you will have an opportunity to turn that around. And the devil says, I'm going to get you. That's what he told him. <laughs> Satan wants you. But I'm going to tell you what. By the end of his life, I guarantee Satan was, I'm sorry I took him on. Because I might have sifted him like wheat, but he tore me up. He spread that stinking gospel everywhere he went. And I took him from, he went from a fisherman to a saint just because I tried to attack him. His words changed. His thought process changed. His intelligence changed. He took the same words, but he had different thought process because he had already overcome an attack of Satan. And anytime Satan came against him to attack him again, he says, you know what, Satan? I whooped you once. I whooped you again. What's the big deal? You're not a bully. You don't bother me. There's no fear here. As my Lord has prayed for me. My Lord has encouraged me. And I know that whatever you try to do to me, it's going to make me a stronger minister. It's going to make me a bigger blessing. It's going to make me a bigger threat. There are more people that are locked up behind the gates of hell. They shall not prevail against me. We're going to go in there, pick them up, bind their wounds, heal their broken hearts, and carry them out. That's what the church of God is about. That's what Christ's body is about. Healing. Caring, loving, protecting, and educating the lost. That they may become part of the army of God and do the same. Go out and make a difference for the truth. Shake hands and be friendly.